नेक्स्ट आमना नेक्स्ट करें प्लीज Is it right now, ma'am? Objectives. Yes, yes. It's object. Today, I'm going to discuss a small case. First of all, then I will be uh, telling you a little bit background about thalassemia and uh, its complications. And what are the updates on the iron chelators? What are the uh, what are the uh, you can see that uh, what are the comparison you can uh, in between different uh, chelators? What is the status? Ma'am, uh, we cannot hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, then I will discuss prevention at a glance and counseling. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is a this is recently we have got this patient. He is one year old and resident of uh, Pakistan and came via ER. with complaints of uh, progressive pilar and abdominal distension for the last two months next please and um, he has got a three a, a, in a three transfusion in the last two months before that there was no uh, transfusion to this child but he was he is becoming gradually pale uh, even despite transfusions regarding his family history he is the second issue of consanguineous marriage no history of blood transfusion in the family other other history uh, is unremarkable when we examined the child he was very pale and of course crying and can uh, the cannula was in his hand vital he was stable he was severely anemic and there was a slight coagulation of prominent with maxillary flaring and uh, he was ectopic also a tinge of jaundice was also there other findings were negative like anthropometry he oh, he was at 50th percentile uh, although the mock was on slightly on the lower side Uh, uh, in systemic no. examination, in systemic examination, there is some. Uh, uh, in systemic examination, uh, the, um, he has got massive hepatosplenomegaly. Almost fourteen centimeters of liver span was there, and six centimeters uh, spleen was palpable. And uh, um, otherwise, the projecting dullness and fluid still was negative. So, other systemic examination was unremarkable. Next, please. next so uh, on the basis of his ethnicity as he was coming from rajasthan we made the diagnosis of beta thalassemia uh, and the, because the age was typical he was represented almost at the, the, the complaint started at 7 months of age sickle cell sickle cell rather uh, mixed hemoglobinopathy or anemia uh, of course it cannot be sickle cell anemia autoimmune hemolytic anemia so investigated the child he was Found to be severely anemic with microcytic hypochromic anemia, and target cells were there. Retic count was 7.98 percent. Rest of the examination was unremarkable. The he was being transfused last month, and uh, so that we could not send the uh, SBL up to process word from the ER, as he was recently being transfused. His ultrasound also showed massive hepatosplenomegaly. so uh, as we could not send the hp electrophoresis we sent the pcr for thalassemia gene mutation and it was found out to be a very rare codon 89 mutation uh, which is not very common uh, he was positive for that so uh, uh, we made a diagnosis of thalassemia major and we are um, otherwise if the patient comes to you for the first time you will go for hp electrophoresis and then you can make the diagnosis of thalassemia and later on confirm it by pcr so what is uh, uh, next please so uh, beta thalassemia is carrier rate in fact in all over the world is uh, 3% but in pakistan it is very high it's 5 to 8% more than 10 million our carriers are in, in present are here in our country so uh, if the carrier uh, is um, getting married with a carrier this uh, uh, of thalassemia minor Uh, we can have the children of thalassemia major almost 5000 to 10000 children are born every year with thalassemia all over the world similarly as the population are uh, traveling and going here and there the problem is growing everywhere 
So diagnostic problems uh, are there when, uh, when you have to differentiate between intermedia versus major. And uh, there are lots of issues in our country of the blood, uh, blood components. Please be, uh, be looking, um, okay, now please hold on. Uh, there are concerns about viral transmission during blood transfusion. There is iron overload. And last but not the least is the life expectancy, which is relatively better in the last few years, but uh, not that good in thalassemia. Most of the children do not survive beyond 20 years of age. So what is thalassemia? Genetically, it is an autosomal inherited disorder, autosomal recessive disorder, uh, resulting from the mutation of alpha and beta globin chain. On uh, chromosome 16, uh, then it would be alpha thalassemia. If there is mutation in chromosome 16, it would be alpha thalassemia. And if you're on chromosome 11, it will be a beta thalassemia. Mo a large number of mutations have been identified up till now. And in Pakistan, we have got lots of mutations. Uh, 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 almost 100 mutations are identified in Pakistani population also. Now, when the patients come to you with the history, like I have presented, with a progressive pillar since the age of the typical age is six months, but thalassemia intermedia can present till the till, uh, till five years of age or maybe later on. So you have to take the full family, medical history, family history, and then you will go for plain CBC. And CBC you can uh, you can see uh, you can uh, see microcytic hypochromic anemia with low MCV and MCHC. And then on HD electrophoresis, you can make the provisional diagnosis that whether it is a beta thalassemia or it can be a, a carrier stage. Um, in our Pakistani population, ferritin iron deficiency anemia is also not, not very uncommon. So we have to, uh, if we are doing uh, screening for the carrier stage, we have to rule out the iron deficiency anemia. Now, this is a very important chart, which is going to tell you that what are the what is alpha thalassemia and what is you beta thalassemia? As far as we know that they are the classic hey, is the next next please. Lesson, mujhe, mujhe lesson, <laughs> dekha hai, ne, next please. 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 Ma'am, please unmute your mic. Uh... Now you can hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, now there are two, uh, four chains, uh, four globin chains, alpha, two alpha chains and two beta chains in a normal population. Now for each alpha chains, there are uh, there are two pairs of genes. If the if the if the all the pairs are infected, then it will be a homozygous state. Similarly, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to focus on the beta thalassemia. There are uh, if there are two genes of uh, there are two genes of two different genes of beta, and which affect, which makes the uh, beta globin chains. If any one of these genes are affected, so uh, the there will be there, there will be uh, either a mild state or beta thalassemia major, or it can be a, a thalassemia intermedia. So what happens? This this will be the electrophoresis of the different chains. Uh, if it is uh, the, in the normal, usually uh, two alpha and two beta chains, uh, HBA and HBA2 is uh, less than 3% and HBA is 97%. If it is beta thalassemia minor, so HBF is uh, uh, min uh, sorry major, then HBF may be from 90 to 98%, HBA2 is almost 2%, and HBA uh, is uh, almost absent. If it is beta thalassemia intermedia, they will be elevated A2. There, there will be 60 to 80 percent of the fetal hemoglobin will be there, and uh, uh, HBA is 20 to 40 percent. While in the minor state, uh, hemoglobin A is 95 percent, while HBA2 is from 3.2 to 3.5 percent. If it is, uh, of course, if it is um, uh, the cutoff is uh, more than 3.5%, if it is there, then we will call it thalassemia minor. Thalassemia minor, you know, they are just the silent carriers and they transmit the genes of uh, um, thalassemia. Now, uh, in the, in the, on the molecular, if, uh, electro, electro, after the electrophoresis, we usually, usually go for molecular analysis. Next, please. Uh, molecular analysis commonly, uh, basically, we can identify the known gene mutation on the PCR-based procedure. But if you're, you have got a strong suspicion of 
Uh, Ma'am, uh, your voice, we are unable to hear you now. Pakistan, you can see the most common is IBS 15 and the second is FR89 in sense in KPK and uh, of course in Punjab also. But while rest of the gene mutation are relatively uncommon. This is again a, 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 a picture showing uh, the common mutations in population. The common mutation is IBS 15, which is all uh, which is prevalent in all. Uh, communities of Pakistan, except in Maimon community, we found that uh, the deletion of 619 is relatively more common. Uh, this is again a recent study uh, study from Karachi, and FR89 is the second second common uh, second common mutation. Now, uh, why it is important to know the uh, mutations? Because then you can go for antenatal diagnosis, and then you can uh, look for other uh, treatment options. If you know the mutation, then you can uh, you can I didn't, uh, you can go for antenatal uh, diagnosis also, and you can go for the uh, different uh, other uh, treatment options also. Now, what happens in thalassemia? The clinically, there will be uh, neck medullary and extra medullary erythropoiesis. When there will be extra medullary erythropoiesis, then there will be visceromegaly, like hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, usually, the, as the fetal hemoglobin weans off till the six months of age, and now the adult hemoglobin is being made from the six months. The, the clinical presentation is at the age of six months. So the child is going to present with severe micro, uh, severe anemia, and you are going to investigate. There will be severe microcytic hypokalemic anemia. If there can be mild jaundice, as there is excessive hemolysis is going on, there will be hepatosplenomegaly, and the children are sometimes really failure to thrive. So why uh, 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 there will be typical thalassemic species, maxillary hyperplasia, flat nasal bridge, and the frontal bossing. Of course, if you have seen the cases, you can identify a thalassemic species uh, despite the medical management in Pakistan easily uh, because their supportive therapy is in most of the centers are not that good. Uh, however, in exam, you can also ad uh, identify the uh, thalassemic child by these Typical species, they have got extensive dark, uh, excess, excessive pigmentation uh, all over the body because of uh, iron stimulated melanin production. And they can be uh, uh, hepatomegaly, uh, hepatic fibrosis later on, and they, will be, they can be cardiomyopathy also. And the, the children can go into the cardiac failure due to, uh, due to iron overload, repeated transfusion. Now, why there is the, the common question which we often ask that why there is hemolysis uh, in a thalassemic patient? So there are several reasons of hemolysis in um, in uh, a thalassemia in thalassemic children. Number one is that because of excessive, if there is a defective beta chain, then there will be an excessive formation of um, excessive formation of alpha chain. These excessive alpha chains. Uh, then get deposited on the RBC membranes. And this RBC, uh, on the RBC membrane, uh, on the RBC, because of this deposition in RBC membrane, they are easy, they will be hemolyzed very easily. Now, the second most common cause is the cellular apoptosis. There will be a um, premature cellular ap apoptosis of RBCs in the marrow of the RBC precursors because of this, again, the reason is, uh, it is said that region is many, uh, 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 because of uh, several oxidative free radicals are released. So there will be a cellular apoptosis in the RBCs. And of course, the mature RBCs because of excessive alpha chain production, there is defective beta chain production or absent beta chain production, the lifespan is, uh, of RBCs are short. So basically three reasons, excessive alpha, uh, alpha chain deposition on the cell membrane make them easy to hemolyze. Number two is the cellular apoptosis at the bone marrow level. And number three is uh, decrease uh, RBC survival sign in the blood. So these are all uh, caused the hemolysis and uh, the process of hemolysis then go on and on uh, till you are going to interfere or stop and can lead to all these uh, uh, all these kind of present, uh, all these kind of complications, 
uh, medullary and extra medullary hematopoiesis in the body. So the basic the line of stay, stay basic management is of course blood transfusion. Ideally, patient should, should, receive, uh, should receive the RBCs which are deployed depleted of leukocytes, but unfortunately, it is not possible, uh, especially the countries like Pakistan, and at least match for at least D, C, E, and Cal antigens. But again, it is not, uh, it is not a common practice even in Pakistan. Transfusion should be given at the three to four weeks of interval. Uh, Pre-transfusion hemoglobin level of 9.5 to 10 should be maintained. Then ongoing monitoring of transfusion associated reactions like for infections like hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and of course, HIV, you know that uh, blood can be, uh, uh, these all should be screened before the transfusion and transfusion should be done in an idea, from an ideal, properly equipped blood transfusion center. And, and then there is a chance if you are going to transfuse again and again, uh, and if the, uh, the blood is not properly cross matched then there will be a chance of aluminization. So then the, if there is aluminization, aluminization occur and you have bond, then autoimmune hemolytic process then uh, continues besides the hemolytic process of the beta thalassemia and the blood transfusion requirements increase tremendously. So you have to be, uh, you have to take care to transfuse a proper cross match blood. Now, uh, uh, the investigations uh, whom you are going to transfuse, you should, uh, do the hemoglobin levels at least on two equations, uh, more than two weeks apart, uh, or uh, if, there, if there is hemoglobin is more than seven, but any uh, facial changes are there, there will be poor growth, there are fractures, and there, uh, there is clinic, clinically significant extramedullary hematopoiesis, uh, then you can trans. Actually, these are the basically, these basically are the guidelines for the thalassemia intermediate level. So you are going to transfuse, if the hemoglobin is less than seven on two occasions or more than seven or any of the following changes like uh, poor growth or fractures are there or uh, spleen is enlarged and then you are going to transfuse to thalassemia intermediate patients also. Now, what about the complications? I am going to highlight the complications first and then I will going to discuss, I'm going to discuss the complications of the management. Uh, now the the systems which are susceptible to pituitary, the mustard gland is the highest uh, highest area which is susceptible to the uh, iron overload. Then there, there is heart, liver, pancreas, and of course, when as the, so the, uh, so the um, endocrine, endocrine system is the most affected followed by heart and the liver. Now there are cardiac complications are basically divided into two groups. First one are the iron mediated and the other one are the non-iron mediated. Uh, iron mediated are those in which the myocyte failure occurs, there will be endothelial dysfunctions, and of course, because of the iron deposition in the cardiac muscle, there will be arrhythmias. However, in the non iron mediated uh, are the pulmonary hypertension, vascular stiffness, thrombosis, and myositis star uh, starring. These are actually because of the free radical injuries to the, uh, to the cardiac muscles and the, to the uh, tissue of the heart. So uh, these basically, uh, the, the iron overall complication are basically are the reversible ones. However, uh, uh, the non-iron overload you have to monitor conservatively. Now, what about the management of the cardiac complications? Arrhythmias, of course, should be treated as a medical emergency. Combination therapy of desperoxamine or defepirone can be used and routine T2 star images, T2 cardiac MRI should be done. Echocardiographic changes are also very important. You uh, should be done uh, annually in all the patients of thalassemia, and you have to monitor the uh, tricuspid uh, regurgitation, and if the velocity is more than three, uh, three, then you should go undergo for cardiac catheterization. Uh, now, um, to, to avoid the cardiac complication, uh, to promote the uh, cardiac health, the smoking, the physical the smoking should be prohibited and the regular physical activity should be uh, vigorously promoted in the thalassemic uh, patients, like in any other patients. Now, what about the liver complications? Each unit of blood almost gives 200 to 250 milligram of an iron to the liver. So uh, it's a major, major cause of uh, um, uh, area of iron overload. And besides iron overload, there are transfusion-related reactions also, 
which can uh, infection which can cause liver damage like in hepatitis b hepatitis c this can all uh, damage the liver so in uh, deferocerox the third common uh, commonly used uh, oral agent has been found to be very very useful in the um, in the uh, iron overload in liver uh hepatitis c and hepatitis b uh, chronic uh, uh, if the patient has suffered from hepatitis c like we often see that the thalassemia patient especially in pakistan can become hepatitis c positive so uh, uh, hepatitis c if they are positive then they should be treated with uh, the recommended drug therapies which are available nowadays uh now there are other very important group of complications of infections uh, which are uh, like uh, desperoxamine related uh, yersinia enterocolitica infection and hepatitis a b c so if the patient has suffered and if you have got a doubt in uh, that patient has suffered from yersinia enterocolitica uh, it can be fulminant uh, and it has been reported into the patients uh, in the western countries more often than the eastern countries uh then you can temporary discontinuation of desperoxamine and prompt initiation of antibiotics is strongly recommended and uh, then you can uh, use oral synthetic uh, uh, oral iron insulators uh, other than uh, desperoxamine if you cannot use desperoxamine you cannot use des desperoxamine later on you have to use oral defibron or defacirox uh Uh, so the transfusion of free storage liquid depleted rbcs have been uh, if they are, should be used in less than 14 days then if they are uh, of course they are beneficial otherwise there is no use and splenectomy can be done in a uh, selective cases now endocrine complications are also a long list of end, uh, endocrine complications but uh, uh, if the relation is appropriate then uh, the uh, the the endocrine complications can be prevented Uh, the most common is the growth delay or delayed and uh, uh, delayed puberty you can see in this graph this is a, 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 a this is reported from a center a large center in uh, in italy um, so hypogonadism and um, uh, impaired fertility is the most common uh, because of deposition of iron in the pituitary in the gonad and uh, this can lead to uh, hypogonadism and infertility later on of course short stature because the pituitary is very sensitive to the iron overload then diabetes is very common uh, before starting growth hormone you should check uh, hbo1c and blood sugar levels then the hypoparathyroidism you, uh, you the people have seen this definitely hypoglycemia in uh, thalassemic children and of course hypothyroidism is also common so uh, how to prevent growth retardation um, the, the most important is improve uh, blood transfusion so to to as to decrease the hypoxia and of course improve the chelation therapy in, nutrition is also very important the, there most of the time uh, the the thalassemic children are, don't have a proper appetite so you have to uh, you have to uh, you have to counsel them about proper diet and supplements like vitamin d folic acid zinc and carnitine uh they are the, all the um, multivitamins are very very important because there is a catabolic state and uh, it, uh, it uh, so you need to give all the, these kind of uh, multivitamins and minerals to the patients of um heart, uh, thalassemia uh, of course you can start growth hormone but problem over here uh, is again the uh, the cost is a, a big problem in our setup so you can give the growth hormone therapy then induction of puberty and proper time and thyroid replacement in hypogonadism is extremely important you have to start the uh, the sex steroids at the right time because otherwise the bones become compromised so you don't if uh, uh, by the age of 13 years and in girls and by the age of uh, even in girls before then that 12 to 13 years and by 14 15 years you have to start the uh, uh um, the sex uh, replacement like in testosterone in boys and uh, uh estrogen in girls you have to start it so uh, uh pubertal assessment is regular is very important and uh, uh, you can um, start uh, pubertal assessment and then you can after the doing the all the regular analysis you can start the treatment with uh, 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 uh sex steroids thyroid dysfunction is also very common subclinical hypothyroidism is is very very commonly seen in hypothyroidism 
but if the uh, normal uh, T4 is there, TSH is five to 10, you know, don't need to give anything. But in norm with normal T4 and TSH more than 10, you need to start thyroxine in some of the cases. And if the overt hypothyroidism is there, of course, high TSH and low T4, of course, you have to start the thyroid replacement therapy. Hypoparathyroidism is also not uncommon. Uh, CEOs are very common in these patients. So you have to give both calcium supplementation and of course, uh, activated vitamin D and vitamin D supplementation on regular basis to all the uh, thalassemic patients who are uh, suffering from hypoparathyroidism. Adrenal insufficiency, of course, the dark pigmentation often, tend, uh, often tempt you to do the cortisol and the ACTH level. And sometimes you really find cases of adrenal insufficiency and then you have to give the treatment for adrenal insufficiency. The fertility and pregnancy uh, in belch-related patients is uh, documented uh, in all the thalassemic children, but majority are subfertile due to hypohypog and uh, because of, uh, of course, because the reason because of hemosidiosis in ovaries and testicular tissue. Uh, those uh, uh, the assisted uh, reproductive techniques can be used and planned pregnancy is essential both in spontaneous and uh, assisted reproductive conception as uh, a thalassemic patient can, uh, is, uh, is pregnancy is very, very risky for both the mother and the baby. Risk can be minimized through pre-pregnancy counseling involving the multidisciplinary team like hematologists, uh, gynecologist, cardiologist, and of course, obstetrician, and a good counselor, of course, with a specialist nurse. Um, so uh, pregnancy uh, per se does not alter, uh, alter the natural history of thalassemia, but it is safe if the proper treatment and normal resting cardiac functions are uh, there. However, if the cardiac function deteriorates, uh, this, this peroxamine therapy can be used after the first trimester, but very carefully. So this is all about uh, certain complications which you uh, uh, which which can occur due to uh, iron overload <laughs> and due, to, uh, due to different infections and uh, because of um, uh, different uh, chelating agents the complications of uh, uh, giving the chelation therapy these are all the complications but if you uh, uh, but if you give a proper chelation all these complications can be delayed and can be halted. We have got patients who are almost, mashallah, 40 years old and they are doing good. Uh, the advancement in chelation therapy is like, uh, you can have, uh, besides, uh, besides transfusion, you can have the pump therapy going on. Like often in often thalassemic centers are offering a camp for, um, um, uh, for desperoxamine chelation. So uh, a few slides about what is basically iron overload. It, 500 ml of blood gives you almost 250 milligram iron. So transfusion hem hemocidrosis is basically the main cause of late mortality in Pakistan. So uh, uh, the, the iron deposits in almost any, all the tissues of the body. Next please. Uh, if you are not giving any chelation therapy, like some of the patients in Pakistan are not receiving any chelation therapy, the accumulation of iron will progress relentlessly. In iron damages, like I've told you, heart, liver, endocrine glands, all the things could be there. So, uh, so the most important thing is, uh, I'm going to repeat it, that how you're going to prevent the liver and the, uh, 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 you are going to do the biopsy or how you're going to diagnose the liver iron concentration. Uh, the basically, the, 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 the diagnostic is liver biopsy, but most of the time it is invasive, a painful procedure and the risk of uh, uh, serious complications are there. And of course, it requires a, a proper, uh, uh, proper physician, um, skilled physician. So uh, you can do the uh, serum ferritin, which we commonly do. It is ex inexpensive. It is a uh, useful measure of monitoring chelation therapy. It has got a positive correlation with mortality and mobility, but it does not tell you the actual uh, amount of iron in the blood. It's an indirect measurement of iron burden. It fluctuates in response to inflammation and abnormal liver functions. So. It, it has got its own disadvantage. But however, if you are monitoring the ferritin levels, then it, it is relatively a good marker. 
so it has been seen that uh, uh, disease free survival related to the body iron levels assessed by uh, serum ferritin has been proved to be useful in so many studies uh, so for the liver iron load either you have to do the biopsy or you will go for the serum ferritin level but however nowadays c2 star mri is done for the cardiac iron overload uh, it is a non invasive procedure but again it requires a several expertise Uh, so it it also tells you the pathological status of liver and heart uh, can be assessed in parallel however this is a uh, this is a drawing showing uh, cardiac iron overload and the liver iron load but you can see that sometimes it does not correlate both of them this is a very very high uh, iron deposition in the cardiac muscle however the liver is relatively normal in in this picture it is vice versa next piece next next thing so uh, how can we achieve a better survival with the newer oral iron sedators uh, ideally it should be a specific uh, for uh, uh, specific for iron uh, chelation it should be a good chelating efficiency uh, there should be a iron balance uh, uh, there should be tissue and cell penetration should be there the oral viability should be good and uh, relatively non toxic so uh defrox uh, desferoxamine is the first iron chelator and uh, but it has got a uh, several side effects infusion related side effects uh, eye side effects hearing loss and it has got its own skeletal dysplasia growth retardation and bone changes if over chelated uh, it has been observed in several studies that it can cause a, a specific skeletal dysplasia and short stature so because because it is um, a, a, an iv agent so a high degree of non compliance in there and among the thalassemic patients so we need to go to oral so oral is the def defepidone which is used uh, for long in um, um, in a subcontinent but uh, up till now uh, recently it has been recommended by um, uh, by uh, fda also again the side effects so you have to monitor for the side effects like it can cause severe neutropenia it can cause arthralgia it can cause nausea vomiting and abdominal pain sometimes the patient are really unable to tolerate because of the uh, uh, severe uh, nausea and vomiting so you have to change the uh, you have to change the drugs so you have to change the chelator and data also have suggested that even the cardiac overload with defepidone defepidone has improved the cardiac iron overload has improved it has been proven on Uh, cardiac T2 star M MRI. Uh, now the third commonly uh, used uh, oral agent is Deferoxirox. It's generally well tolerated in adults and pediatric population. Uh, safety profile is similar uh, as compared to the adults. Sexual and physical development proceeded with normal parameters, so it is a very good. Up till now, it has proved a good oral chelating agent. Uh, chelating agent, but unfortunately, the cost is little high, so patients have to really struggle. for it uh, if uh, you are putting them on the frostrox um now this is a very important slide which tells you the different uh, uh, comparison of different chelators the usual dose is there and you can see 25 to 60 mg uh, while defepidron 75 mg per kg per day and the frostrox is 30 to 40 mg per kg per day uh, so it is given the uh, desproxamine is given subcutaneously in 8 to 12 hours and 5 days a week but it is excellent uh, uh, excellent excretion in urinary and fecal excretion of iron is there after the uh, desproxamine it is time tested and the the maximum benefit to the patient but again the compliance and the side effects are there while defepidone is oral and you have to take it three times a daily and the half life is 3 to 4 hours basic excretion is urinary and the side effects are uh, again granulocytosis and neutropenia and arthralgia uh it is not sorry it is not fda approved but outside like we use it and uh, uh subcontinent uh, india also use it in many patients while defrosidox is relatively a new uh, it is orally used it's once a daily and uh, uh, you can take it easily so the compliance is good uh, if you are taking it once a daily the main excretion is uh, is uh, in the feces and the, the side effects are there and it is licensed by fda 
so uh, different uh, iron and uh, deferosterox pakistani experience is also a uh, good so in monotherapy and as well as in combination therapy next piece next next uh, next 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 uh, the this is a recent study in pakistan and the and the conclusion is that previous current please uh, effective iron chelation therapy is the only way to improve the quality of life and growth and development and long term survival of the thalassemic patient compliance is mandatory otherwise you cannot stop the iron deposition in the body and you have to use uh, then the, the patient um, does not have uh, the quality of life and of course the uh, quantity of life both are affected deferosterox is effective and relatively safe with a good compliance and uh, liver has in, inside the liver it has got a very very uh, specifically reduction in the liver iron concentration and cardiac uh, status is also improved after the uh, chelation with deferosterox so now the, the the basically the other the definitive treatment of the um uh, uh, thalassemia is of course the uh, uh, the bone marrow transplant there are different or, uh, options of bone marrow transplant in thalassemia major is there like with hla identical sibling uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is of course in pakistan we are doing it hla well matched and related donor uh, but uh, in, it is not being done in pakistan however it is being done all over the world Uh, HLA match unrelated cord blood is, is still in experimental state, and HLA match related donor transplant it is still. But we are doing the HLA identical sibling uh, uh, stem cell transplant in Pakistan, so bone marrow transplant in Pakistan. So it is the best curative modality, and uh, it replacement uh, it causes the replacement of defective marrow by uh, stem cells. And this is a four fourteen hundred transplant is up till now performed in uh, uh, in uh, over the years in uh, after the two, year two thousand in one twenty eight centers in twenty three countries showed that the five year uh, survival is eighty nine to seventy nine percent respectively. So uh, uh, overall survival and the overall survival is also ninety percent, which you can appreciate. and uh, the disease free survival is almost 79% so bone marrow transplant is is the basically the main stay of curative vein curative stay in um, uh, the uh, in the thalassemia uh, next please next next uh, in this slide you can see that 166 patients of thalassemia Uh, has this is a one center study uh, uh, of pakistan which is showing uh, uh, 66% survival and uh, it's a really an um, uh, a really a, a, a good survival rate and later on the disease free period is almost 50% in most in in the patients in uh, having bone marrow transplant in pakistan so bone marrow transplant the again there is a criteria there is an age limit there is a clinical state uh, status the willingness to undergo the treatment the donor availability and uh, the, uh, the compliance and adhere to the proper uh, proper uh, treatment is very important but if uh, the proper efforts are made then the outcome of the uh, transplant is uh, very good now points to remember about beta thalassemia major is the bone marrow transplant is the only curative treatment for beta thalassemia major uh, however uh, thalassemic Uh, in thalassemic blood transfusion and iron chelation are the mainstay of therapy in our part of the world and uh, mainstay of the treatment in prevention is the only way in with which we can control the thalassemia and last but not the least is the hemoglobin augmentation is the realistic hope in years to come so uh, uh, what are the alternate and the novel approaches uh, Uh, so after the post transplant you have to uh, take care of the patient very well also alternative and novel approaches are also there which are being uh, studies in uh, studied in pakistan and many patients are being treated with alternate uh, alternate approaches so uh, basically the the alternative approach is the basic one is the augmentation of the fetal hemoglobin uh, what happens is that uh, because of uh, excessive alpha chain formation there is uh, there is a, a deposition of 
alpha uh, uh, precipitation of alpha genes in all the red cell membranes and that causes excessive hemolysis but when you are augmenting hemoglobin f you are uh, you are uh, putting more ga gamma chains in the blood so the then the rbcs are uh, unable to hemolyze and or hemolyze less so that is the basic concept of hemoglobin augmentation agents uh, in using in beta thalassemia hydroxy urea has been found to be very useful in the treatment of uh, thalassemia as an alternative agent as an augmentation of uh, fetal, uh, for the augmentation of fetal hemoglobin uh, similarly in pakistan in karachi have several trials has been uh, conducted for the efficacy of hydroxy urea and uh, um, uh, that uh, any uh, hydroxy urea has been found very this was the trial conducted by sakib dr sakib and dr tahisham c team is a famous trial and it, the hydroxy urea has been found to be very effective in uh, preventing the uh, beta thalassemia uh, some of the patients of beta thalassemia free of transfusion so it was studied that why why the, some patients are responsive to uh, hydroxy urea while other patients are not responding to hydroxy urea next piece so that was the basic reason was some genetic mutations are responsive to hydroxy urea while other genetic mutations are not responsive to hydroxy urea so this is another advantage of doing the uh, pcr for genetic mutation that you can identify those patients who will be beneficial with the augmentation of hydroxy urea so the the uh, xmn polymorphism next please and uh, next The, the, the patients who are having XMN polymorphism in their genetic workup, so they will be respond to uh, beta uh, hydroxyurea. It is basically a genetic uh, modifier, uh, which, uh, 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 which with the, the patient with XMN polymorphism, they do exceptionally well with the uh, hydroxyurea therapy. So, uh, some uh, care uh, complication risk scores to validate the severity of thalassemia score has been identified, tailoring the patient which can receive the hydroxyurea therapy. So, if you want to try hydroxyurea, either you have to refer it to a proper hematologist or uh, you, uh, uh, after the uh, genetic analysis. Um, now, the, this is uh, this is again another study from Pakistan by Dr. Sakib. Uh, it tells us that IBS15 is the most common mutation and homozygous and 60% of the heterozygous uh, uh, heterozygous uh, states was found and the response rate for XML polyrhythm was 73% um, responsive to hydroxyurea. So the genetic mutations which are can be treated without blood transfusion with hydroxyurea is XML polymorphism cap one mutation ivs one mutation cap plus one mutation e beta thal thalassemia patient and triple beta thalassemia patient these can be treated with hydroxyurea excellently and the blood transfusions become very very maybe in one year after the infection or so but you can uh, uh, treat them on hydroxyurea and they do very well uh, the children do very well if the genetic mutation of uh, uh, these type of genetic mutation are there in thalassemia uh, recently, another drug has been tried, which is thalidomide, and thalidomide has been studied uh, uh, a comp in combination with hydroxyurea and alone also. Uh, it, the, this is a recent study which has been showing that 89 patients who were given both the drugs were good respondents, 16 patients were responders, and 30 patients were non-responders. So the responders, again, the genetic mutation was not favorable. So the future direction is studies, more studies are needed. Uh, the thalidomide uh, for, to uh, to confirm the thalidomide action uh, or its uh, efficacy. Thalidomide again is uh, again is basically uh, um, uh, is uh, causing the excessive augmentation of the hemoglobin F and leading to less hemolysis and maintenance of hemoglobin. So the, these two drugs, hydroxyurea and thalidomide, are hydroxyurea is almost uh, used in many cases, but thalidomide is still in experimental cases. Use in experimental cases. However, both are, both are very helpful in helpful in augmentation of fetal hemoglobin. So these are these can be the future of many thalassemic patients. 
uh, in order to uh, to decrease the, the the blood transfusion rate and later on the complications with iron overload. Gene therapy is also uh, going on, but it's still in very very experiment and it's still in a very uh, preliminary stage. Other therapies which you have to give to thalassemic uh, patients besides uh, uh, have, uh, the iron chelation and other agents. Uh, there is, it is a hypercatabolic state all the time. The hemolysis is going on. So you, you need to give zinc supplementation. Uh, you need to give vitamin C in conjunction with, especially with the scroxamine, uh, or if there is a deficiency of vitamin C, you have to call the scroxamine. Uh, helps, uh, uh, will, uh, in this conjunction with vitamin C, helps in removing the iron from the blood. But recently we have seen a child of thalassemia with the scurvy. So if you have seen, if you see early signs or you see the signs of uh, vitamin C deficiency, you can you should start vitamin C in children with thalassemia, but not in all the cases. L-carnitine can be used uh, 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 in uh, children with a beneficial dose of 50 milligram per kg per day. Again, it should be used in caution if the patient has got hypothyroidism. Dental care is extremely important so that the chances of infection are, uh, are uh, low. Again, the tobacco and the other substance abuse should, should, should be, uh, for, the, for these should be, uh, uh, should be avoided. Uh, now, in the last, uh, in the last two slides, I'm going to tell you about this splenectomy. Splenectomy is indicated, it helps a lot in, if there is an increased blood requirement, if annual transfusion is uh, uh, more than 200 to 220 ml per kg per year, then you need to go for a, a splenectomy. But usually we do splenectomy if the children is, uh, are above 10 or 12 years of age. If, uh, then uh, the other indication is aluminization, then the blood transfusion requirement will increase uh, tremendously. Uh, so uh, you have to, uh, you can you, you go for a splenectomy in proper setting, in proper, uh, uh, proper hospital settings in which all the uh, sub, uh, all the all the uh, maximum care will be there because the patients will become sick and can have any infection. Uh, if there are cytopenia, if there is an evidence of hyperesthesianism or symptom massive splenomegaly, sometimes you have to do uh, the splenectomy. Again, before the splenectomy, you have to vaccinate the children against pneumococcal, meningococcal vaccination, which is very important. And sometimes you have to put the children on uh, prophylaxis of penicillin uh, for uh, till they are up to 15 or 16 years of age. Lastly, a few words about the prevention. Of course, the carrier uh, screening is very important. Uh, carrier screening is very important. Unfortunately, we cannot implement the law of carrier screening up till now. However, we can do the antenatal diagnosis. Of course, the CVS is being done uh, in many centers in Karachi. Uh, in uh, first trimester, you have to do, do the CVS and amniocentesis in the second trimester, uh, second trimester. So then you can send the PCR for a genetic mutation. Of course, uh, you have to do the parent's PCR also. Uh, diagnosis can be made before the 10th week of gestation and there are purpals um, are there to go for therapeutic abortion if the, uh, if the fetus is suffering from uh, thalassemic mutation. Uh, uh, also, if the newborn uh, is uh, uh, born, then you cannot do the electrophoresis as there is high uh, concentration of uh, fetal hemoglobin. Then you can uh, do the uh, um, you can do uh, the uh, genetic analysis or the DNA analysis to confirm the diagnosis of thalassemia. Uh, but again, in the new, uh, uh, again, it is uh, you have to uh, you have to. Uh, assess the child later on when the child is six months of age. So counseling, as in all cases, is very important. Nature of the disease, proper immunization is very, very important. Uh, gen genetic counseling, carrier screening, car uh, carrier screening, of course, is very important in the diagnosis. If the patient has got a family history of thalassemia, of course, you can uh, you can um, advise them that there are all the all the siblings should be screened of both the uh, of both the father and the mother. And uh, later on, you can assess the. Uh, um, you can um, advise according to the uh, according to their uh, uh, according to their. Uh, if they are minors, then you can advise accordingly. So a holistic approach is targeted so that the patient can uh, the, the patient can achieve a normal patient can can have, uh, spend a normal life. Uh, 
like they can do a normal physical activity they can go to schools uh, the clinic and trust in times will be flexible some some schools are uh, doing the um, the the teaching was so uh, for the uh, for the calisthenic children lies on with the teachers are also next piece lies on with the teachers are also important so you have to fully rehabilitate the child of calisthenia uh, parents are really uh, uh, parents are really struggling with their lives so you have to support them also routine monitoring of the growth uh, is necessary so as to monitor uh, for both the iron uh, for both the uh the complication of the situation and for the uh, or end of task thing also nutrition sector should never never be forgotten as we are living in the part where nutrition is also on the lower side so you have to uh, uh monitor the nutritional factors also the micronutrients and the macronutrients definitely should be considered if there is a poor growth uh besides uh, iron uh, iron overload and the blood transfusion thank you so much my references are basically the listing and national federation and a text to get it and uh in some slides that you have to help as we are off so uh, before treating like in any other case uh, you cannot cure uh, you can not cure all the patients that you can comfort them and you can uh, counsel them properly but of course the uh, the treatment and the uh, proper treatment and proper transfusion and proper chelation and of course proper diagnosis and later on intermediate diagnosis of course very important in the holistic approach of calisthenics thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for such an informative lecture and our house is open for the questions you can unmute your mics and ask question directly and we have shared the link for survey please uh, fill that link as well so you can ask any of the questions and someone has uh, uh ma'am am i audible yes you are audible uh, ma'am someone has asked can we use hydroxy uh, hydroxyurea in thalassemia major as well yes as i have told you that there are certain thalassemic uh, mutations in thalassemia uh, like xmn polymorphism is positive and uh, there is a was a slide in which the capsa mutation is put on it and mutation in the you can use uh, hydroxyurea but not in all the cases uh really these patients are uh, if you are diagnosed the patient with thalassemia major you should go for pcr for thalassemia gene and you look at the genes the genes which are suitable and which are responsive to hydroxyurea you should use hydroxyurea in those patients but if the facility of pcr is not there and there is a little infrequent transfusion like you are suspecting thalassemia intermedia then you can also use it but with proper supervision With CBC and SBT in your follow-up, then you can use the hydroxyurea. Otherwise, the best thing, the recommended thing, is that that you should you should go for PCR for thalassemia gene and identify the mutation, and then use hydroxyurea. Thank you so much. Um, ma'am, next question is price of bone marrow transplant and uh, government centers in which um, bone marrow transplant is being done, and CVS price and lifespan of thalassemia major patients. actually the the uh, the identical uh, the haplo identical or the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the classical hla match with sibling is only being done with uh, um, in pakistani centers like in nibd and the children hospital is the with the ideal matching with the sibling it's only being done in pakistan at the moment in karachi and haplo identical uh is done in some centers like in uh, uh, in uh, aku or and in the uh, not in aku i don't i'm not sure about aku but to me uh, in all the centers in pakistan at the moment is doing the uh, the ideal the mesh uh, complete mesh actually uh, identical sibling transplant at the moment and haplo identical is being very rarely done uh, but it's being done outside the country okay um so the next question is ma'am the other uh, question was other question was antenatal diagnosis the cost is like almost uh, the procedure cost in uh, the center which i know is uh, 10 to 15000 and the, then there is a separate cost for pcr for uh, the, the dna analysis which is almost in 
uh, in a good uh, in is almost from 15000 to 30000 so in 40 to 50000 30 to 40000 you can have an hla uh, sorry uh, you can have an antenatal diagnosis uh, in private centers and in some uh, government centers is being done uh, in <coughs> punjab but not in karachi at the moment so ma'am next question is um, in heart we do uh, t2 mri for iron deposition in remaining organs like adrenal pancreas pituitary which test we do to check for iron deposition um, uh, at the moment we are not doing any uh, test in pakistan to check the iron overload in pituitary uh, you can just have a, a biochemical yeah, you can have uh, the hormonal profile it can tell you that the pituitary is working or not like you can have for the puberty you can do the ssh lh and the uh, the the home uh, the uh, for in both boys and girls uh, you can do uh, testosterone level and estrogen levels in girls so you can have then uh, for growth hormone you can do the itc uh, insulin tolerance test to check the uh, growth hormone levels in uh, the stimulation test for growth hormone levels and similarly igf1 levels to see Uh, what is the IGF levels in uh, uh, in the patients of thalassemia who are short stature? But directly you cannot uh, you cannot do the MRI and check the iron status of the pituitary. At the moment, to to my knowledge, there is no such thing. But you can have an uh, indirect idea by doing the hematological um, uh, hormonal profiles uh, of uh, different hormones. You can have an indirect evidence that the pituitary is not functioning properly. Similarly, with the pancreas, you can have um, HDL. Uh, you can have a glucose tolerance test or fasting plasma glucose. If it is more than 126, then you can say that it is early uh, hem hemosiderosis of the pancreas, and the patient is developing uh, diabetes or bronze diabetes. Uh, you can have an indirect evidence with ultrasound, I think, but you cannot uh, uh, do any other tests in pancreas also. um the question is lifespan of a uh, thalassemic patient with chelation and without chelation without chelation there is there is nothing there you cannot even patient cannot survive uh, beyond uh, 10 to 15 years of age if so they do very badly without chelation they can have massive vitromegaly and they can die uh, they can uh, the prognosis is not good at all so if the patient is having a regular transfusion monthly transfusion then you do you have to give uh, chelation otherwise there is no there is no advantage of giving even blood transfusion so uh, if the patient is having blood transfusion you have after almost one year uh, uh, if the ferritin level is more than 1000 you have to start uh, the um, you have to start the chelation and if, if nowadays we have got all the three options which are freely available in pakistan and you can start uh, with any of the three uh, which you want and which are available and um, um mechanism of fractures in thalassemia patient uh, there is a, there are uh, uh, there is uh, there are different causes of fractures in thalassemic patients uh, number one is that there is uh, medullary arthroposis the bone becomes weak there are no hormones Uh, in the body to uh, uh, like testosterone in males and estrogen in females are not being secreted so the bone mineral density becomes poor day um, uh, vitamin d because of uh, poor intake and because of several other things uh, so the the chances of fractures are because of all these um, uh, factors are very high in uh, thalassemic patients so uh, the bones become gradually weak but uh, of course you can feed them properly you can give them uh, uh, vitamin d you can give them calcium supplementation <laughs> and of course if they are not treated uh, then you can later on you can uh, give uh, bisphosphonates uh, yeah, uh, especially after 15 years sometimes to decrease to improve the bone mineral density you have to uh, uh, you have to give uh, you know, bisphosphonates also to the patient and i'm uh, now on the last question um, is there any law for thalassemia screening before marriage at the moment pakistan mein bill to pass hua hua hai for about um, uh, to come to screen all the uh, 
uh, all the couples before the marriage for thalassemia for uh, career uh, for career state of thalassemia but unfortunately us par amal daramad nahi ho raha we are unable to follow it all over the world like iran and countries like us uh, they have uh, almost uh, uh, eradicated thalassemia because of this law if, if the patients are thalassemia um, both the both the uh, both the cup, uh, husband uh, both the couple is thalassemia minor or both are carriers of thalassemia minor then you can of course uh, do the antenatal diagnosis even if they get married but before that you need to before the marriage you can screen the uh, screen the couple and then you can advise them properly unfortunately hamare yahan aati the taboo ban jati hai and uh, it's not being done but the parents uh, but the families who are aware of the complications of thalassemia and who have seen uh many kids uh, in the family thalassemia uh, thalassemic children are there they are going for some of them are really going for career uh, career screening but up till now we are unable to implement the law of career screening uh, before getting marriage in pakistan a uh, madam one question uh, okay okay uh, in, in thalassemia patients already they have increased uh, fetal hemoglobin and if we do hbf augmenters like uh, hydroxyurea thalidomide we are increasing uh, hbf so uh, is it it going to worsen the situation no no actually then the hemo- uh, all the hemoglobin will be almost fetal hemoglobin so the chances of uh, uh, hemolysis then becomes low and the excessive alpha chains are not being formed because the gamma chains will be there so uh, the uh, then the chances of hemolysis become low that is the theory behind Uh, the hbf augmentation so uh, that uh, uh, and that decreases the chances of hemolysis although it increases the fetal hemoglobin but the chances of hemolysis becomes low and if the hemolysis is low the oxidative injury is also becomes the free radical formation is also low because which is because of hemolysis the hemolysis also produces free radicals with more over which uh, which damages more to the other uh, to, uh, to the other tissue, uh, to the tissues of the body and to the rbcs also so the beauty behind the augmentation of fetal hemoglobin ke wo sara hi hbf hota hai to hemolysis ke chances kam ho jate hain aur wo good hbf hota hai jo ki aapki um, hemolysis nahi hone deta ya hemolysis ko slow kar deta hai thank you so much ma'am uh, there is another question what is the indication for iv versus oral chelation देखिए मैंने इस पर काफी डिटेल में बात की है दैट आईवी चिलेशन जो है वो एक्चुअली सम ऑफ द चिल्ड्रन आर रियली कंप्लाइंट नहीं होते मोस्ट ऑफ द चिल्ड्रन इवन इफ दे आर सम टाइम्स लगवाते हैं फिर नहीं लगवाते हैं एंड एंड द अदर चांस के उसमें सम टाइम्स देयर आर सर्टेन कॉम्प्लिकेशंस एंड इट इज लिटिल कंबर सम टाइम वो 5 टू 7 डेज ऑफ वीक लगाएं बिकॉज़ उसकी हाफ लाइफ कम होती है सो दैट इज वेयर द कांसेप्ट ऑफ ओरल चिलेशन सम ऑफ द पेशेंट्स रियली डू वेरी वेल on oral chelation like that's defepiron and uh, defrasirox they do really very well so <coughs> if the patient is uh, uh, is uh, tolerating and doing the uh, the iv chelation with defrasirox so the, the recommendation the best is uh, the uh, uh, defrasirox and but if is unable to do the compliance is poor then you can of course start the oral agents uh the oral agents the uh, the defepiron is only have the side effects of uh, uh agranulocytosis or neutropenia otherwise it is well tolerated similarly defrasirox the it decreases the liver iron load very well and uh, cardiac iron iron overload is also uh, also um, uh, cardiac iron load also becomes low after the defrasirox so uh if you can do the iv chelation that is the best otherwise please do give some any form of the oral chelator either defepiron which is very cheaper or defrasirox which is little expensive but please do give oral chelation if the patient is having transfusion thank you ma'am thank you so very much this was a very informative session we are we are very grateful to you so now um uh, this is all about today's meeting and uh, thank you ma'am and now i'm signing out uh there any um, i have asked all the questions as well so ma'am now we are ending the meeting thank you thank you thank you so much thank you ma'am shalak